All right. Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. And we've got a very special guest lined up for this week's episode. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, David. And I'm going to play the role of the listener this week and just try and absorb as much as I possibly can. Well, thanks, Nathan. And yes, we do. We've got legendary copywriter and info products publisher, Chris Haddad, on the show today. And for that, I am grateful. No problem. I was happy to be here. I'm, I'm happy too. As a freelancer, he was so good that one of his clients referred to Chris as money fingers. And Chris and I happened to be working together at the time. And I told him he should take that word and run with it which he has. He's now Mr. Money Fingers. I think he mm -hmm. has a business called Money Fingers, Inc. As a marketer of his own products, Chris went way outside the niche and managed to get himself on a national TV show with Rachel Ray, you know, the famous cooking star, Rachel Ray. This was for his product, Text the Romance Back. And though he really is legendary today, Chris was once just another under the radar copywriter. And that was a long time ago, for sure. I only bring that up to point out that he's worked his way to get to where he is. And I'm hoping he can share some stories and secrets you'll find inspiring as well as useful for wherever you are on your path. Now, the immediate next step on your path is this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in the highly regulated industries like health, and finance and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So let's get into our show. First of all, Chris, welcome and thanks for joining us. Oh, no problem. Always happy to be here. Uh, yeah, always a joy. I mean, as I don't know if people know on this call or not, but you were uh, one of my first ever copywriting mentors way back in the day. I, uh, I, I picked your brain outside whatever that, that not very well done event you did with Carlton and Gilstein uh, <laughs> was years and years ago. And uh, Copy Express, it was mentor. called, I think. Copy, Copy Express, otherwise known as the event you guys didn't quite get around to planning. <laughs> but it was, but it was a fun weekend nonetheless. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. No, really happy to be here. Yeah. So let's talk about you. I found people at very high levels in this business speak about your work in hushed tones, unless they have a competing product and then their voices get a lot louder. Could you tell us how you got started, how you get started on a project and how you've been able to create so many winners? I'm always looking, so my, my thing on copy is like, I mean, and, and maybe I've learned this from you, but I've learned it from a lot of people, but like, you know, a, a good copy can't make a crappy product good, but a good, I, I, basically I, I try to think of the concept of the product and the title of the product as part of the copy. Like, so for my most recent offer that's been running for ages now and has done really well on YouTube traffic, it's called Make Him Worship You. And I was like, okay, what are the women in my niche? What do I know they want after 10 years or so of doing this and selling millions and millions of dollars worth of product? And what they really, really want is for men to worship them like a queen and treat them like the most beautiful, sexually attractive woman in the world, et cetera. So instead of like sitting there and being like, I have a passion product to write a book about how to break dance on the moon and then trying to sell that, I'm like, okay, I know my market really well. What do they want? Let's create a product where the title of the product is basically exactly what they want and the benefit, and then the copy can come up afterwards. And that tends to work pretty well for me. So like a lot of copywriters might start writing copy when they start writing copy. Sounds oh, like yeah. you start writing copy the moment you start to conceptualize a new product and you're writing copy with the title and you're writing copy with the name of the sections. I mean. You're just if I'm, doing, if I'm doing the product, I'm writing copy as the product, right? Like the entire thing is basically that. I think the advantage to being a copywriter who's doing your own products is that you can do it that way, right? As mm -hmm. opposed to being a copywriter who's working with somebody else where they think they're creative enough to come up with a product idea and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, and then you have to try to find a way to take that, you know, square peg and put it in a round hole and make it as exciting as possible. I mean, maybe you've had this experience with the number of times uh, with like Joe Barton or somebody, Joe Barton who gave me the Mr. Moneyfingers name years ago, yeah. he would send me, send me the product, I'd write the copy, and then he'd come back to me later and say, hey, we have a customer uh, who is writing in to say, ask what page <laughs> this incredible bullet is on. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, okay, I took this really boring thing that you put in the book and I made it really, really cool. What you should actually do when you get my copy is you should take the copy and you should go back and change the book. <laughs> like, don't make me try to make the copy sell your boring product, take the board, take the copy, take the boring product and make it good enough for the copy. I bet he responded really well to that. He did. You know, I made Joe a lot of money and I didn't charge him that much because I was young and stupid. So I think he's, uh, I think he's doing just fine about the whole thing. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, this is the thing I wanted to talk to you about the most, the stories you write at the start mm -hmm. of your VSL scripts and your sales letters are like nothing I've ever seen. And I really mean that. You seem okay. to get so deep into the mind of your prospects that sometimes I wonder if you're using acting techniques to emotionally become your prospects. How do you get uh, so... Yeah, I mean, how yeah. do you get so in touch... Yeah, I mean, so how do you do well, that? Well, a couple of ways. Okay, so for one thing, I do have an acting background. I, I was never a great actor by any means. I've always been a way better writer than actor. And I'm a good performer. Like, I'm really, you see me speak. I'm really good at, like, being myself on stage and keeping yeah, people yeah. entertained and things like that. But I did act in high school and college. Um, and you learn something about, like, you know, how to get into the mind of a character, how to uh, think like somebody else. I do think a lot of what has made me able to write the way that I write is actually, uh, we talked about this briefly beforehand and, and not on the call, but I did deal with a lot of mental health issues that kind of came to a head a few years ago. And the downside to that is um, it makes you want to kill yourself and you're miserable all the time and you're et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The good side is that it makes you very, very good at experiencing incredibly intense emotions. And what I eventually figured out in my copywriting career, when I kind of moved away from the more standard way of writing copy and started developing what I do, which just kind of happened after I was working in the relationship uh, in niche, is discovering, oh God, I lost my mind a little bit there. Um, but just, just learning how to take those incredibly intense emotions and taking the emotions that I feel, and I felt some really horrible emotions around shame, around failure, et cetera, and taking those things that were kind of fueled by my mental illness and saying, hey, I'm feeling this, maybe if I just kind of assume that everybody else in the world feels a version of what I'm feeling, because everybody feels not good enough, everybody feels ashamed of themselves, et cetera, and I can take that and put it into my script, so that's where that, that kind of passion comes from. Those stories, man, sometimes they come really, really easily, and sometimes I have to like bang my head against the wall until I get them. Um, I think you read that You Can't Hit Yourself Thin scripts that we're hopefully going to be testing in about two weeks now, finally. Yeah, I and it took I me a it. long time to get that one figured out, to figure out just how to open up that letter. And a lot of times it's just like getting out of your own fucking way. You know, you try to get really complicated, you try to get really cute. And then like with You Can't Hate Yourself Thin, which is a uh, product about weight loss, obviously, the first line of the VSL eventually ended up being, uh, you, can't help, you can't hate yourself thin. Uh, my husband, my husband screamed when he, when he, when he found me, oh, no, you can't hate yourself then. My husband, my husband screamed as he stared at my bloody knuckles as I, as I lay on the bathroom floor or something like that. That's about this woman basically trying to vomit up the food that she can't stop herself from eating. And that took me a long time to figure out exactly how to dramatize that emotion. I knew what the emotion was, which is this feeling of powerlessness and this feeling of failure. Why can everybody else lose weight, but I can't? I keep beating myself up over and over again, but I still can't find a way to lose the weight. And taking that core emotion and making the entire letter really about that core emotion. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, one thing I'm wondering, and I don't think this has ever gotten in your way and rarely gotten in my way or Nathan's way, but I think for a lot of people, pop psychology, political correctness, um, uh, the uh, conventional wisdom keeps copywriters from going there. It's like, mm. you know, shame is so 20th century or, right? I mean, do, do you know what I'm talking about? That there, I do, but emotions are emotions. Humans haven't changed. We're the same goddamn creatures we were 10,000 years ago, except for maybe a little bit stupider and a lot more polluted, right? Like, <laughs> like nothing, you know this. Like, you I know. know. Like, like, Garf, like, you know, I mean, we're on this email list with a bunch of copywriters and the politics comes up a lot. None of us are surprised by the craziness going on in the world right now, right? Because we're no. fucking copywriters. We're people who have spent our entire careers developing a certain contempt for humanity because we see every single day with the numbers on the screen, exactly how irrational human beings are. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, I used to tell, when I was a bit of a harsher person, I would talk about these kind of things. I would tell people, it's like, you can either do what you think works or you can do what actually works. You can live in reality or you can, you can live in the fantasy land where you can not use these powerful emotions and still make the sale. But direct marketing, especially in the niches that I've played in, it's a war. 
you know, you're going to war every single day. You need to use every weapon you can just to manage to liquidate your traffic enough to actually make some money. It's not a, yeah. it's not a business when, for the weak of heart. When you're going to war, you don't really worry about which weapons are politically correct, right? You don't. I mean, you, you worry about which weapons are ethical to a, to a, a certain degree, I hope. And you uh, worry about which weapons are legal, certainly. Um, this is why I actually am pro-regulation in certain ways, because it's pretty hard to compete with somebody who's lying the entire time, mm. uh, whereas you're trying to be an ethical person actually selling a product that works. Great answer. Thank you. Um, I think it's fair to say that you're a contrarian. Um, what are some things that everybody says you should do that you disagree with and what do you recommend or in fact do yourself? Uh, so wait, what do, what do people say? Oh, okay, yeah, what do people say you should always do? So one thing that I, Kilsing and I got in a conversation about this once and Harlan was also a mentor of mine once upon a time. But one thing that I figured out for my particular copy, I'm not saying it's for everybody else, but for my particular type of copy, um, which is very emotional, very storytelling based. Um, you know, occasionally I'll go back and do things in a different style, more of a webinar style, whatever. But most of my stuff is really, uh, why am I having a hard time keeping my train of thought today? Oh yeah, what do I do differently? So the number one thing that I do differently is making the storytelling and even most of the copy at the, in, in, through the first half of the letter, um, me focus instead of you focus. You know, we all mm -hmm. know in copywriting, the you orientation is the number one thing. Say the word you. If you say the word me, then people are going to go running off in the other direction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't find that to be true at all. Because what I want, like if I opened up a letter and said, um, uh, you know, you can't hate yourself thin, no matter how much you may think you can, and just making it all about you the entire time, to me, it feels a little bit aggressive and it feels a little bit like, like you're kind of stepping into somebody's space. Whereas if I open it up, in a way where the woman or the man who's like actually speaking through the letter is sharing an intimate detail and sharing their emotions, I find it brings people in a bit. And then when I finally start transitioning into the idea of selling the product, that's when I actually start saying you, 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 you throughout the rest of the letter. Okay. I, I'd say in that case, you're using more of the storyteller's craft and less of the traditional, maybe even blindered narrowly, seeing copywriter's path because when it's you it's not you chris it's you the character yeah. speaking through that character who is a stand-in for your prospect nevertheless i agree with you it's, it's a very different way of doing things yeah um, i've done there... it both ways where it's the pro where it's both either a prospect who is basically giving a long-form testimonial about how the product got created etc like our, <laughs> our kissing product or it's like with language of desire where the actual, um, the creator of the product was the one who was telling the whole story. We actually find they both convert pretty well. I've used, the one thing that we haven't seen, uh, I, I, I was still bad about this because for the longest time I was doing all our VSLs, I was voicing them as Michael Fury. And then we figured out that we sold a lot more when women were the voices in the letter. So I was like, oh, I'm not special anymore. Yes. So what did you get a, a Michelle for you or a Mike, Michaela for No, Fury? no, no, we just have, we just have other, uh, uh, other women, we, we publish other people's products, so there's that part. And then actually for like Make Him Worship You, the product is actually a Michael Fiore product that I created with uh, with my wife Angie. Um, the, the, uh, the the woman voices the, the letter and then talks about Michael Fiore throughout it, which actually works really well because it increases the credibility of Michael Fiore. And I don't have to actually spend the time uh, establishing credibility. I'm Michael Fiore, here's why you might think I'm awesome. I can just have the woman in the letter talk very briefly about how awesome he is and it builds him up in a way that it wouldn't otherwise. Okay. Uh, no argument that your copy is provocative and yeah. um, it sells a lot, but it must also generate a lot of reactions, um, positive and negative from JV partners, from customers, <laughs> maybe from competitors, especially jealous ones. What, what, what are some of the reactions uh, you've, what, what are the most interesting reactions you've gotten to your copy? Oh, besides people trying to rip it off and then trying to get me to promote the copy they ripped off. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> not interesting. That's just pathetic. But um, uh, yeah, it is. It happens. I actually got somebody's uh, offer thrown off ClickBank for doing that. They were really, uh, they were. They, I was very angry at the time. I was an angrier person once upon a time. And they sent me an offer and said, "Hey, will you promote this?" And it was ninety nine percent my copy. They had changed like a few names or whatever. And then when I called the guy and said, "You need to take this fucking down," he's like, "It wasn't my fault. It was the copywriter." And I was like, "No, it's your business. It's your fucking." Fall, don't throw your people under the thing, and I got a picked off clickbank. Sorry. Yeah, but I mean, other than the the reaction, obviously that's uh, oh sure, yeah, yeah, quite a compliment. Um, Imitation, sincerest form, blah blah blah. But yeah, yeah, I mean, what? How do people react to 
You know, I, I mean, maybe early on, there were some very visceral reactions. Uh, when I got into the relationship niche in particular, nobody was doing anything like the kind of copy I was doing, which I had learned largely from doing launches, from doing make money online related stuff, some health stuff, et cetera. And there were a lot of people, everyone in that niche at that time was basically just aping Evan Pagan with everything they did, right? Which is a very specific way of writing a letter. Um, one that I find kind of boring, you know, Craig Clemens, who's amazing, did it back in the day, but I think he's moved on to much more interesting and more powerful stuff since then. The main reaction from affiliates is just like, holy shit, I'm making a lot of money and they don't really care. Honestly, I've never had an affiliate come back to me and say, I won't promote this because it's, you know, too emotional or too whatever. I mean, I've had them come back and say, I can't promote this to my list because it doesn't fit along with what we're selling or whatever, but nobody's ever been like, oh no, this is too hot to handle. People just want to make money and know that you're actually going to pay them on time. Okay. And have you ever gotten any hate mail from prospects whose buttons? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. But I don't see those. Right. Cause like, cause Oh yeah. You, you set up a yeah. filter. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have, I mean, that early on, 10 years ago, sure, I was doing customer service because I think it's valuable to do that. But the thing is, when you're the face and the name on the product, as Michael Fiore, you've missed Chris Haddad when I was doing copywriting stuff, you get hate mail. You get people threatening you. You get people, um, I had uh, guys write in and say, hey, I bought your Text the Rome, text, text your X back pro product and it didn't work. My ex-girlfriend, who I used to beat the shit out of, still won't spend any time with me, so I'm going to come and blah, 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 blah. I had a stalker come to town once a couple of years ago a woman from Atlanta who fell in love with Michael Fury and legitimately thought that we had a relationship. Um, this is a pretty common thing, actually. We've had that happen a bunch of times. See, yeah. that's never happened to me as, as, as vicious and passionate as I am. You're but not, you're you, not selling romance, my friend. Yeah. That's true. I'm, I'm in a different niche. Okay. People see Michael, women see Michael Fury. Some, some women do, I'm not going to speak in, in generalities, but women that fall onto my list and things like that, they do tend to imagine Michael Fury as this kind of perfect man, right? Which is hilarious to anyone who's dated me or been married to me. Um, but I'm certainly more emotionally intelligent than most guys, which means I'm allowed to and able to uh, communicate these things to them. Well, I want to talk about how in your face your copy is. Mm. Um, seems to me Facebook doesn't look kindly on really strong copy these mm -hmm. days. Yeah. So mm -hmm. how do you work around that? Or do you just simply avoid Facebook as a marketing channel? Um, largely in the past, we have, we've, you know, whenever we've been able to run Facebook, we've made three X our money on day one, like every single time that we've done it, we've made at least three X sometimes, well, not at least, but we've made at least our money back. Oftentimes we've made more than our money back on day one and been able to grow it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it is a lot harder to do Facebook stuff with emotionally hot copy. Largely because of that, we've focused mostly on channels like email and YouTube, though we are currently running a quiz funnel. Uh, which again is a different kind of angle than what we normally do. And we're making, I think we're 2Xing our money within two weeks or something like that uh, on the back end. So we're happy about that. But we have not had great success running directly from a Facebook ad directly to our VSL. We always have to have some kind of bridge page uh, to get there in order to get it approved. When I was mentoring you, that was late aughts, right? 20, 2007, mm -hmm. 2008, 2009. I think 2008 is when I really got going. Yeah. And then I think four or five years later, you started teaching a little bit of copywriting. Mm -hmm. These days, it seems like everybody's a copywriting teacher. And uh, it's like very hot. It's, um, yeah, I feel. And yet that, I don't want to do it, even though people keep asking me to. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that, that was something I wanted to get to. But um, yeah. maybe, and oh, my favorite thing is you can pay $7 and get this badge you can put on your emails that says you're a certified copywriter. I think oh, that's really good. Cool. I don't know, right? I know. Yeah. yeah. But what kind of advice are you seeing getting sent around the internet or around the networks um, that you think is, is just wrong and people need to be <sighs> very cautious I mean, that, that anybody can do it, you know, that anybody can do this, that you should be charging $5,000 right out of the gate, that like, you know, all this kind of crap. I just, I see too many people who, I don't like the puffery or people, you know that what we do is hard and you might be, anybody can get to the level where they're kind of okay. Not anybody can get to the level that they're great. I think that if you want to be great, you need to be a little bit weird and a little bit crazy and you need to be able to push outside the box some. Um, so that's, that's the main of it. You know, other times I've just seen people giving crappy advice around like how to talk to clients or people giving crappy advice about, you know, basically doing work for free and stuff like that. I think it's important to value yourself. Um, but, you know, my freelance career was largely just about networking and going out and just, you know, going to events and talking to people. And I'm not really sure what I would tell young copywriters now 
uh, but when you can't actually get on an airplane and go anywhere. I am very, very glad I'm not a freelancer. I, the, number piece, the biggest piece of advice I give uh, copywriters is as soon as you can, start being a product owner instead. I, I only wish I had done that three years earlier. Why? I would have made a lot more money. Because I would have made more money and it's a lot more fun, right? Like I, 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 what did I do? I 10X'd my income within three years when I went from being a copywriter to being a product owner. Now, granted, I'm not making that amount of money now. I'm, I do fine, but I'm not making what I was then for a wide variety of reasons having to do with my health stuff, et cetera. But I got so much happier. All of a sudden, you know, when I was a copywriter making 20 grand a month, I was hustling every day for that 20 grand. I was trading time for money, right? I, was, mm -hmm. I still had that mentality I had when I was a kid. I didn't grow up rich or anything like that. Both my parents grew up really, really poor. We were kind of middle class, but I had the mentality back then is like, you know, you trade your hours and you get a certain amount of money for it. And that's what I was doing. So even though I was getting paid five, 10, sometimes even 15 or $20,000 a letter, um, I, I, every time I finished one, I had to go back out and pound the pavement again. I had to go find another client. I had to get somebody else who would give me the money and it wasn't easy. And you know, you know about my health issues over the last few, mm. you know, decade, basically. I got hit by Lyme disease. I was in a horrible car wreck when I was younger that made me essentially crippled for years. And then I got hit by massive mental illness issues, um, back to back to back. And it was really, really hard, really, really horrible. And if I was still a freelance copywriter, when all that happened, I would be dead right now. Like not to be dramatic, even though I'm a very dramatic person, if I didn't have passive and semi-passive income coming in from a company that was making millions of dollars a year, um, I, I would not have been able to get the treatment I needed. I would have not, I would have not been able to pay my rent. Like I, I would have ended up either homeless on the street and crazy. One of those guys talking to themselves all the time, or I would have ended up dead. So like, I mean, freelance copywriting changed my life. I went from making 30 grand a year to making 200 grand a year, like a year and a half or something like that. That changed my life, but it was still a step from being a guy who worked for somebody else for to being somebody who theoretically worked for myself, but actually worked for my clients. Also clients suck. Like, you know, this clients are annoying. You can find the good ones sometimes. Like Joe Barton was great. Jeff uh, Walker was great, whatever. But most clients are bullshit. They think they know better than you. And sometimes maybe even they do if you don't know their niche very well. But it just isn't a fun. I don't like being subordinate to people like that. You know, uh, my entire life, uh, I love my life for a variety of reasons, but I don't have to answer to anybody except for the government, basically, right? And that, that's something that I worked very, very hard to build. I don't care about being fabulously wealthy. I couldn't care less. I don't want sports cars and things like that. What I do want is to have enough money to live the life I want and to be free. So I, I don't think you can do that necessarily as a, as a freelancer unless you are at the absolute top level um, and willing to just like work your ass off, which I also don't like working that much. Yeah, maybe it's just me, but I don't think life is about being chained to your desk. So yeah. You know, I've got a lot more questions I'd like to ask you, and we have just about run out of time. Would you please sure. come back next week? I will. I'll come back next week, and I'm, uh, I'll even change my shirt. I'm going to go run change my shirt right now, and then it'll be a totally different day that we're doing this. I'm, I'm cool with that. Okay. Um, I, I, I think you broke the Nathan. He can't even talk now. He's laughing so yeah, hard. Fair enough. No, <laughs> fantastic interview. And cool. uh I'm going to just second one thing that you said, doing the writing for five clients to make 10 or $15,000 a month no versus selling your own product and being a copywriter for your, for what you own. Such a huge difference. And um, if anybody's in the rat race of copywriting right now, I definitely recommend trying to figure out selling something for yourself rather than selling something for a bunch of different clients. It's much more enjoyable. And, uh, I was almost at the point where I was just going to quit copywriting when yep. I was doing that yep. much client work and um, yep. selling for yourself is definitely the way to go. So I'll just to put a point on, to put a really sharp point on that. My absolute best year as a co freelance copywriter, I made, I think $350,000, right? Um, uh, gross. Uh, my worst year as a product owner, which was a few years ago when I could not work, when I was suicidally depressed, when I was so sick I could barely get out of bed, and when I when I was basically crippled, I made four hundred grand, right? Mm. Like four hundred, three fifty, yeah. I'll but I didn't do any work. I didn't do any work. I did. I think I wrote one sales letter that year, right? And I I, I talked to my people. I I was not capable of working. So just to kind of give an idea of like what you should be aiming for. Um, I am grateful every single day that I made the transition from being a freelancer to being a product owner. I, I threaded the needle really, really well. I couldn't be more grateful for it. Well, thank you. Um, this is great. You don't have any um, 
products you don't want people to reach out. there's uh, no people you know people keep asking me the thing is i just don't uh people ask me regularly if i'll do a copywriting product i did some products about 10 years ago and then uh, it just became much more it made a lot more sense to do the the relationship advice stuff because i was making more money and i was kind of sick of selling how to be successful you know i never wanted to be one of those guys whose entire business is based on teaching other people how to be successful because like I'd rather be the guy that went off and was successful and then we'll come back and tell you how to do it. So I, I might do some products I've been asked to by like Stefan George, I and those guys and some other friends of mine. And um, I'm thinking about it, but I have to, I'm still recovering from a lot of stuff, even though it's been two or three years since I got my brain back together. But I think in the near future, some stuff will happen. We'll keep you on the radar and see what happens. And uh, just want to let everyone know it takes Chris an entire week to change a shirt, but um, he's know, going to yeah. do that. And I'm going to start. Ready, ready, ready. <laughs> Woo! what a hairy chest <laughs> all right yeah uh we'll be back next week chris is gonna follow up i don't know how you can follow up this interview but we'll see lot, and until we'll then if you want to get more of your copywriters fix head on over to copywriterspodcast.com and we'll catch you later catch you later okay <laughs> i'm gonna go grab another shirt i'll be right back sure okay <laughs>